Over the past four years, I've lived and explored aboard my sailboat, Adventure Board, an inexpensive 38-foot, 1984 sailboat that I've operated on a super tight budget. I've slowly modified this boat to become my long-term off-grid living oasis, a goal I finally achieve now after more than eight months of non-stop off-grid living throughout the Bahamas. Here's a complete breakdown of how I've been able to comfortably live this remote lifestyle in a tropical paradise, as well the price I've paid for this. To help you understand this complex subject, I've broken it down into 10 categories. Food, water, living quarters, hygiene, electricity, transportation, safety, medical, internet, cost. Let's dive on in. Food, obviously you need it to live. So how do we get that on the boat? There's a few different ways. Food stores. This is what I keep on the boat that I've bought from other places like back in the US. This includes rice, ramen noodle, peanut butter, all these sort of things. I probably keep enough on my boat for about maybe as much as six months if I was to eat nothing else. Spearfishing. This is where I get most of my food from. Over the past decade, I've been fortunate to be able to spearfish around the world and those skills have allowed me to be very successful when I'm here in the Bahamas. There's so much to get out on the reef. This is really my favorite way to go grocery shopping. Fridge and freezer. This year I added a freezer to my boat and that greatly expanded what I could keep on board. As well, the fridge and the galley here will hold anything else I need to preserve it on a regular basis. Cooking. On this boat, I have a simple two burner oven broiler stove and it also gimbals so I can cook on it when I'm at sea. It's pretty basic, but it gets the job done. It runs off of propane and I can usually go about four or five months before I need to fill up on more propane. It's very efficient. Garden and sprouts. Gardening isn't necessarily the most practical thing on a boat, but I've been fortunate that I could get four small garden beds on the boat. These garden beds have green onions, rosemary, basil, thyme, oregano, and all other different herbs, and sometimes some edible food. As well, the sprouts have provided me the majority of the greens I've eaten these past eight months. They're really simple to do, you have many different varieties, and the shelf life for the seeds is quite long. This is my favorite way to get greens when I can't get any nearby in the Bahamas. Multivitamin and supplements. Just in case I'm not getting a complete diet, I just take a simple everyday multivitamin that helps keep my body in healthy condition. There's a few supplements I keep on the boat, but I don't normally take them. If I've had a big workout, I might have a protein shake or I have some electrolytes here on the boat that I'll have uh, to supplement with my water intake. Stores in the Bahamas, depending on where you are, can be few and far between. So being self-sufficient is that much better to keep you further remote and not need as much when you do go to the grocery store. Water, specifically fresh water. There's plenty of salt water all around, but the human body cannot drink that. I used to have to go to marinas or other places on land to fill up jerry jugs and bring them back to the boat. But this year, I found a better way to do it. I installed a water maker. This uses high pressure through a very incredibly fine filter that actually pushes out the salt from the water and separates it. This is how I have the majority of my water, although I do also do rainwater catchment off the side of the boat when it's a heavy rain. You have to be careful with rainwater collection because you don't wanna just take the first bit of rain that comes in. You wanna make sure it's been raining for a few minutes, you scrub the deck lightly just to get any salt or bird crap off the boat, and then you can put it into your tanks. When I do rainwater collection, I usually filter it as well. Living quarters. On board Adventureborn, there's actually eight beds for people to sleep in. Two beds forward, two beds aft, one bed is a sea berth, one bed is one of the couches, and then the other two beds is the couch booth that turns into a double bed. As well, with the way I've organized my cockpit, I could sleep probably another three people out there, plus somebody in a hammock in the back of the boat, and as well somebody in a hammock in the front of the boat, and probably one more hammock along the boom if I really wanted. I'm not good at math, but I'm not gonna try to have that many people on my boat. The point is, there's comfortable beds on this boat, so it feels and really is a house and a home to me. But the thing about a boat is you don't necessarily just live on or in a boat, you live out of the boat. Where I anchor is incredibly important to my lifestyle out here, and that's the beauty of it. If I'm in a place I don't like, I can just move. I can anchor in front of beautiful islands or be near a city, so I have access to regular supplies. It's really anywhere I wanna be, but generally speaking, I prefer to be remote and off-grid away from all civilization. Hygiene. You gotta stay clean out here, and in tropical waters, it's really easy to do. The first thing to help with hygiene, I would say, the ocean. Go swimming in it every single day, whether I'm spearfishing or kiteboarding or snorkeling, freediving, surfing, I'm always in the ocean, and that salt water, especially the Bahamas salt water, keeps me so clean. 
Now, when I do go to shower, I shower off the back using this simple garden hose. I'll first soap up on the swim platform, then jump in the ocean to get all that soap off of me, saving my fresh water supplies. I'll jump back out, use the hose to shower off all the salt, and voila, I'm clean. The toilet. Toilets on a boat are very simple. The one that I have is manually operated. It's called a Jabsco head, and it's probably the most common toilet you'll see on any boat. That all goes back into a holding tank, which I can then pump out later, either when I'm out in the open ocean, away from anything, or certain marinas will have pump out facilities. In the Bahamas, I have literally never seen a pump out facility, but there is so much open deep water space in the ocean, you can easily dump your black water tank out there. This is in no way harmful to the environment, and other sailing YouTubers have made much better videos on the subject than I ever could. I recommend checking out Sailing Uma. They did a great video on this entire subject. Electricity. Electricity is incredibly important so I can run things like my laptop, the camera I'm talking to you on right now, navigation, lights, my water maker, any number of things functions on the boat, refrigeration, freezer, you get the idea. I get 100% of my electricity from my 1000 watt solar panel array that I have on top of my Bimini. The electricity from there then goes into my DIY lithium battery bank that I built myself. I have more than 500 amp hours of usable 12 volt electricity. That is more than enough for all of my needs. But in case the sun isn't shining for a long time or I'm in the dead of winter, I also have the alternator from my engine. That will absolutely pour electricity into my DIY lithium battery bank. All of that electricity then is at a 12 volt system, which runs many of the systems on my boat, including this entire 12 volt panel. As well, I can take the electricity from my batteries and put that through this 3000 volt amp multi-plus inverter. Effectively, this takes 12 volt DC electricity and inverts it into 120 volt AC electricity. Transportation. It's not just that I live on the boat, but the boat moves. That's what's so great about this lifestyle. If I'm in a place I don't like, or if there's bad weather coming, I can move and change my location to something new. There's a few ways I have transportation around the boat and off the boat. Sailing, obviously, is the big one. Using just the wind on the sails, I can move the boat hundreds, thousands, effectively any distance around the world. That's what's so great about this lifestyle. Now, I need a decent wind to sail. I prefer to sail with about seven to hopefully not more than 20 knots of wind. And as well, a lot of times the wind seems to be coming straight at your face exactly the way you wanna go. But that's just part of the sailing life. The diesel engine then is great for when I do wanna go someplace but the wind doesn't want me to. I have a 40 horsepower engine on the boat which consumes three quarters of a gallon per hour, usually cruising at about six knots. This gets me many places reliably if I really need to get in there, as well as my way to get a boat in and out of a slip should I ever need to go to a marina or a fuel dock, which this year I simply haven't. The dinghy is great to get off of the boat and go smaller distances easily. If I wanna to go to the beach, go to an island, go to a dock, go to another boat, anything like that. My dinghy can reach speeds of up to 20 miles an hour, and it's pretty good on fuel with a 15 horsepower outboard. A dinghy is sort of like the car to a house. If the sailboat's the house, dinghy is the car. Paddleboard. This actually, believe it or not, is a great way to get around. A lot of times I'll be near small islands that have super, super shallow banks to them or mangrove rivers that I can easily paddleboard and go exploring up. Inflatable paddleboards can collapse down to nothing and usually I just drag them right behind the boat and it all works out. Safety. On a sailboat, some of you might be thinking something like, what about pirates? That's absolutely ridiculous. There hasn't been any piracy in the Bahamas and I don't know how long. Maybe back when they were using gunpowder. The Bahamas is incredibly safe, especially if you're outside of Nassau. Nassau is a real city, so it does have the problems of crime, but all the out islands have the nicest locals in the world you could ever hope to meet. As far as the emergency equipment I keep on the boat, I have things like an EPIRB in case my boat starts to sink or I need help. That sends out a satellite transmission to emergency responders. I have multiple things like that on the boat which I can go into detail in another video. Many sailboats carry a life raft, I do not. It takes up a lot of space and it also costs a lot of money. However, I do have a very reliable dinghy and a paddleboard. Not ideal compared to a proper life raft in the worst case situation, but at least if my boat did start to sink, I think anybody would go to their dinghy first because it also has a motor, so you could get away from the situation. Weather is honestly your biggest factor when you're looking at being safe when you're far off grid on a sailboat, particularly with hurricanes. These past eight months, I ended up riding out three near hit hurricanes. None of them were a direct hit, so I was fine to be on anchor for them. But for all three, I made sure my boat was in a secure location. 
That is very important for both the safety of your boat so it doesn't get broken, but more importantly, the safety of yourself and anyone else you have on board. To get the best weather updates, I usually go to NOAA as their hurricane tracking models I find to be the best. Besides that, there still are freak storms that come out of nowhere, strong northerlies that can come down through the Bahamas, and for that, I just look at my normal weather routing software. That might be apps like Windy or Pocket Grib. You can also get weather on the VHF, though I don't anymore because I have good internet service. Whenever I'm out on a dinghy adventure, particularly going spearfishing, I make sure I have this small box in the dinghy with me. This box has an emergency radio, emergency beacon, emergency tourniquet, and a full emergency medical kit. All of this is stored inside of a watertight box. This way I always have it with me. Something I wish more cruisers would carry on board. It doesn't take up much space and it could save your life or someone else's. Medical. For this category, I just wanted to cover all the things that go into basic human health to keep us healthy and strong out here. The first one I would talk about is just personal health. I lead a very healthy lifestyle. I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't do any drugs. I make sure you get plenty of exercise, eat well, and that's really it. I think I maybe get sick once a year with like a, some sort of a cold or something, but besides that, I stay very healthy. As well, when it comes to things like COVID, coronavirus, or any other pandemic, you really couldn't be safer than being out on a sailboat in a remote location. It's a pretty cool plus to living this alternate lifestyle. Daily medication. I don't really keep any daily medication on the boat besides my daily multivitamin, but other people might. For other people who are looking to do this lifestyle but have medication they need to take on a regular basis, I recommend if you can, stocking up ahead of time. That is something you can't really get around though, so try to take on as much of your medication as you can so you can stay out as long as possible. My main medical kit. This encompasses many things I have on the boat from hydrogen peroxide, rubbing alcohol, band-aids, and many other things like Benadryl. I keep a well-stocked kit for this, as well as things in case I get a large cut or a gash, like a medical grade stapler. Not something you wanna to have to use, but something I have had to use before. Internet. I know this isn't necessarily a need as you could get by without it, but in today's day and age, you really do need internet to go from country to country, get weather updates, and even just to communicate and enjoy yourself if you wanna watch some YouTube. For the past two years, I've been using this little Alive hotspot. It's got a little battery in it so I could take it with me, but it usually stays on the boat. I don't know how the Bahamas does it, but the internet service here is ridiculously good, uh, particularly when you're in remote places, I found. I've been in places where I could not see another light of any house, home, or any sort of civilization, and I was watching YouTube videos, and it could have been a little quicker, but it was pretty good. I also have a local phone if I really need to, but I don't usually keep that updated with any minutes or data on there. It's more just for emergencies. And then I've also noticed a lot of other sailors are going to Starlink. That will be a future purchase of mine. That will solve a lot of problems. But if worse comes to worse, I can always ding you over to another cruiser boat and they'll be happy to let me use a little bit of internet, which I've done before when my internet does run out. The sailing community as a whole is incredibly hospitable and will help you with pretty much anything if you yourself are a cruiser as well. Don't be afraid to ask them for help. Cost. This question I get constantly. How much does it cost? The big thing to know is I don't have any holdings anywhere else in the world. I don't have an apartment, a house, a storage unit. Everything I own, everything that I am is on this boat. It can be a little bit nerve wracking sometimes when you're looking at coming into an anchorage that has some rocks sticking up. Okay, so here's an approximate budget if you were at a marina or a mooring ball. Exactly the point of this video is to avoid doing those things to save you more money. But just to give you a little bit of an idea, a monthly rate for a marina can be as low as 500, which really would be on the low end, to more than 3,000. And that's only considering my 38 foot boat. If you have a bigger boat, it's gonna cost you a lot more money. And if you're looking for just a single day or a single night at a marina, for my boat, that could run me anywhere from 90 to $300 per night. So again, having only lived on anchor for the last eight months straight, think about how much money that saved me right there. Next, I wanna mention that it took quite a bit of time and money to get my boat to be able to anchor out for eight months straight, no problem. It's not something you can just do with any boat. There are systems involved, like the water maker, that make a substantial difference, but they also have an initial investment to them. I did some quick numbers, and I could pretty much say that I've spent around 14 months working on my boat over the last four years to get it into this state. Now that's a lot of my time and blood, sweat, and tears to get this boat to this state. As well, I probably spent something in the neighborhood of another $23,000. If you've seen my boat tour video, which I recommend that you watch, you'll know that I spent $23,000 originally to buy this boat. The boat worked, I could sail it, I could do everything with it, but there was still more I wanted to do to it. So over the past four years, after I crunched all the numbers, and this includes me staying at marinas occasionally, and at one point I was actually at a marina for, I think, six months, 
and last year I was in a boatyard for seven months. So I factored all that in. Every nickel and dime would probably be another $23,000. That factors out to about $500 per month, which if you think about that is a lot less than most people spend in rent. But now I have a boat that's substantially more capable. So I look at that as an investment, not as a cost. All right, this is the big one that you all want to know. What does it cost me per month to live out here on Anchor? How low can I go? Truth be told, I could actually just spend no money in a month. And I think I've probably done that before. Just didn't go to a grocery store that month, actually. I'm sure that I did. Uh, however, I do have a few other expenses that are reoccurring. I have pretty cheap boat insurance, 50 bucks a month. For my internet, I could go as low as 70, but I usually pay 90 bucks to get a little bit more of that hotspot so I can stream and upload data. That's very important to me. I figure I usually spend somewhere in the neighborhood of $150 to $300 for myself when I'm solo sailing on the boat. Now again, with the food stores I have on board and if I'm really dedicated to and spearfishing on a regular basis, I don't need to ever spend money at a grocery store ever again. But that gives you somewhat of an idea because to be honest, I am an omnivore and I do like to have steak once in a while. When I first entered the Bahamas, I had to pay $300 for a one year permit for my boat. That doesn't cover me, I don't have to spend anything to have a visa for myself in the country, but that does cover the boat. That was a one-time fee, $300, and then I'm good for the rest of the year. So when you start factoring all these things down, it gets pretty cheap. However, when I have a crew member on board, this usually at least doubles my grocery bill, if not more, because they might have particular food items that they like to get, or they just like to eat a lot of the ice cream on board. So everything totaled, how much does it cost me per month? I figure it cost me around $500. And I would say it cost me, if I average everything over time in the last four years, I'm still looking at about $500 per month all around. Now, I still plan to make a couple other improvements to the boat, and once I do that, I'm really gonna be good for a very long time. But most people usually make improvements to their boat that aren't necessary. I've been able to go extremely far in what I have. To give you an idea, my mainsail is as old as I am. It's probably time for a new mainsail. The personal cost, yep. That's right, folks, it's not just about the money, it's also about the personal cost that it takes on you. In 2019, I was in the Bahamas for three months on and off with crew, and honestly, I felt super burnt out and I had to get back to the US and to civilization. After that, I returned to the Bahamas a couple years later and did seven months and still felt a little bit burned out by the end of that seven months and was happy to be back in the US. This year, I've been out for more than eight months now. I don't really feel bad at all. This is something that most people don't know about. You don't just get into the sailing lifestyle and just go on a boat and completely change your entire lifestyle. It's something you need to work at and change over time. And I think the best way to do this is to go out and do it for a little bit and come back to civilization. Go out and do it a little bit longer, come back to civilization. This will also help you to appreciate the sailing life as right now I'm editing at about 30 knots of wind. Sometimes it gets a little annoying. When you go back to land life, you begin to appreciate the things like stability. But then you start to miss the things like true, absolute, utter freedom, crystal clear water, spearfishing, and kiteboarding. It's all a balance, and that's what I wanna get across to you guys now, is that there is a personal cost to this, but if you can overcome that, if you can work through it, it really is worth it. This is not just some speculation of what could work. This is the basics of what I've done day in and day out for eight months straight, and will be doing for many months and years to come. And you know what? It's worked great. For anyone who's inspired by this and wants to follow in my wake, my advice would be this. Go simple, go small, go now. If you want to see more content like this, get exclusive access, and help support my endeavors, please consider becoming a patron. It makes a considerable difference and helps me to produce more content like this. If you want more details about my sailboat, check out the boat tour video on this channel. If you want a better idea about what the day-to-day -day sailing lifestyle is like, watch my most recent vlog episodes on this channel. Thank you, and I hope to see you on the next adventure.